So if possible, can you recall the events years before you began to record these rap performances, sitcom appearances, uh, interviews, music videos, documentaries, and commercials that led to you archiving this footage? Like, what were the events? Right. Um, the events that probably led to it probably was born inside of me. Um, not only do I, did I do it and do I do it for hip-hop, I do it for many facets of my life, and I always have. So although I'm known currently for archiving that hip-hop era of 90s and 2000s, I've been archiving every aspect of my life from as long as I can remember all the way up until now. So essentially what happens for people like me is that Words matter. Welcome to the Words Matter Pod with the Kill Pinaka podcast dedicated to storytellers. I'm here with hip hop archivist Claudio Abreu, creator of the popular hip hop VCR platform. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. How are you? Doing good, man. Blessed always. Yeah. So we are here in uh in Mount Vernon in Claudio's uh, photo studio. Yep. But Claudio also is known for hip hop VCR. Yes. And uh hip hop VCR is a I guess you would say it's a uh, archival hip hop platform that documents or repurposes different interviews, hip hop interviews, uh TV show appearances, mm -hmm. sitcom appearances, performances, news, be news between the years of 1997 and 2005. Yep. So, who are you? Hmm. Depends how you're asking that question. Yeah. But um, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm passionate. I'm a photographer. I'm Claudio Brew. Um, I'm human. <laughs> I'm Dominican. <laughs> <laughs> uh, many things. Um, I guess it depends on what day. But um, um, some days I'm the shit. Yeah. Others, I need to work. Yeah. On myself, on my craft. Sometimes I'm the best. Yeah. So it depends, but hopefully that answers it. Did I say your last name wrong? Say it. I said Abreu. That's one way to say it. Okay. Um, since I'm not so finicky, uh, people say it's, it's Abreu in Spanish. Yeah. So you're in that cadence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But then people in America go Abreu. Mm. So I accept I accepted all. I was born in America, so, I mean, I remember my kindergarten teacher. She was like, a brew, and I was like, I'll take it. Tomato, tomato, they probably hit you with one right. of those. <laughs> right. I never correct nobody, so. so. Yeah. But you, you said it good. All right, thanks. So, if possible, can you recall the events years before you began to record these rap performances, sitcom appearances, uh, interviews, music videos, documentaries, and commercials that led to you archiving this footage? Like, what were the events Right. Um, the events that probably led to it probably was born inside of me. Um, not only do I, did I do it and do I do it for hip hop, I do it for many facets of my life and I always have. So although I'm known currently for archiving that hip hop era of 90s and 2000s, I've been archiving every aspect of my life from as long as I can remember all the way up until now. So essentially what happens for people like me is that once I like something, mm -hmm. I want to archive it because I want to experience it again Yeah. in the future. So I think of, I think of myself when I was 15, I was thinking of myself when I was 70, like mm. 70 year old Claudio is going to want to see this. My purpose for archiving anything was never to necessarily share it with anybody it was always a selfish act <laughs> and so um but now when i started hip-hop vcr back in november of 2021 um i felt like there was a need and a, and a responsibility for me to put this stuff out there um and so then i was i was pushed towards that but um 
people like me and myself, once, I, I, like I said, if we enjoy something, you know, you're going to find ways to archive it. And I was always a photographer. Yeah. Photography is a form of archiving. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm learning that, learning that now. And essentially, I'm learning about myself and why I do what I do. So I've been photographing since I was a kid. And I learned that from my mom. And so, again, so there was a VCR in my home, you know, like many homes during that time, and tapes of movies and who knows what else. And so I started actually recording basketball games, Michael Jordan games, uh, back in 94. 94. So I had already started recording, like, every Michael Jordan game that appeared on national television. Yeah. I was there. So um, once 96 came around and, like, I started getting into hip-hop heavy and I started liking it, Tupac, Wu-Tang, Method Man, I was like, you know, I, I want to start, I, like, I want to, like, this stuff is incredible. And I started recording it. So it's something that's always been inside of me. It's not a coincidence that I'm a professional photographer. Furthermore, I'm a professional photographer for our people, black and Hispanics. And so... On my hard drive, I have over a decade of photos of our people. Yeah. It's an archive. I know I run a business, and my intention wasn't to um, um, archive our people, but it turned into that. Yeah. So I naturally always fall into that. I've been videotaping my kids since they were born, literally day one all the way up until now. So, like, me and my wife will sit in front of the TV. We just did this the other day, and I'll just, like, shuffle wild videos. And we'll just, oh, they, when this happened, with that stuff we haven't seen in over a decade. I have a 17-year-old and an 11-year-old. And so I I just archive everything. Every, my whole life is archived. Yeah. Everything. So it's just something that I naturally fall into. And hip-hop happened, and I archived it. And it's just part of my journey. Yeah. Just naturally like that. What is that one thing, you know, in family and all of the things that you love in, in hip hop? What is that? Is it just like in your nature to do that? I guess you learned it from your mom, but like what, what about those things? You know, what is like, is it like a tangible thing that makes you say like, I have to, this has to be documented. It's a selfish thing. Yeah. It's all about me. Yeah. It's all about me. It's all about me, I cherish life so much and the experience that I have and the moments that I want to do it again. Yeah. I'm, I have an addictive personality. I've never been addicted to a substance yeah. um, of any type. Like, I don't, I don't smoke. I don't drink. Uh, I love my sweets. But I'm not, I've never really been addicted to, like, a substance, at least, at least not the ones that harm me right yeah. away, like a drug or an alcohol. Uh, but... I live in the moment, and so I want to experience this again. I, And I always am creating. You know, like I tell my kids, you always want to create moments and memories. You want to live in the now. The past is great, but you don't want the past to be the greatest moment you've ever had. Yeah. You want to keep having those moments. But while I'm creating those moments for myself, for my family, for my friends, I'm documenting it just to keep it there. And th that stuff... Uh, morphs into something different later. You don't sometimes you don't realize what you're experiencing until later on. Yeah, it becomes legendary in your life. Mm -hmm. So you know, I look at videos and I go, "Sweetie, I'm a legend." <laughs> 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 yo, and my wife's like, "Yo, babe, you are prolific. Like you really went in." And I was like, "Babe," and it's nothing to me. And so, just the 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 stuff that I've collected throughout my life is just. It, 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 you know, again, I live in the moment, but every now and then I go to the past and I go, damn, Claudia, you killed it and you still killing it right now. And I'm archiving right now, but it's in the present. I don't appreciate it right now. Nobody does because yeah. we're here now. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's just that, that feeling. I don't know. It's a, it's a selfish feeling. It's a selfish feeling. And it just comes from me wanting to have that stuff in the future. And I'm going to do it again. So when I'm 80, I'm going to sit back and watch all the stuff I'm doing now. Yeah. And 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 maybe, like, my family, my great-grandchildren will do something with this stuff further than I could have. Because I feel like I'm also um, I'm, I'm gathering history. Yeah. And even if it's my history, I represent a bunch of people. Yeah. Whether I like it or not. So um, 
it's gonna be it's gonna be archived somewhere one day, hopefully. And um, you know, these times they're important, mm-hmm. and it, it all boils down to somewhere in there. But you know, even though you, you're you, you know, initially it was selfish, but mm-hmm. it seems like over time it turned into a selfless act. Yes, because you're like you said, you're doing this to show your people. Yes, yeah, a hundred percent. Um, absolutely. You know, and 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 that needed to happen. It's almost like I was too young to understand the scope of yeah. what I was doing, and. Now there was a turning point when I got older. What are you going to do with this, Claudio? And it's a subconscious thing. This is not something I'm consciously doing. But I, I happen to be a humanitarian. So that, th- that act is naturally going to transition into the act of sharing it for a purpose. So, again, so I'm doing stuff now that I don't know what... I'm, I'm doing it for myself now, but the stuff, this stuff will be relevant and important to a group of people later. Yeah. You know, um, hey, let me give you a radical example. Let's say that anarchy happens and all these buildings don't exist no more and we're walking around the walking dead. Can you imagine, like, if somebody's archived, like, my, you know, even, like, my home videos of my family or how I ran my business, you know how valuable that stuff will be? Yeah. If there's ever a time when we're no longer experiencing those things, you know? And so especially with hip hop VCR in this example, um, I was sitting on the stuff and, and I felt irresponsible for not putting it out. Let's say I, I got lazy or felt it was too much work, which is, it is a lot of work. Um, and I said, you know what? Fuck that. I'm just not going to put it out. I'm sorry. I don't know if I should be cursing. Again. That's fine. <laughs> okay, cool. I didn't ask you that. But, um, um, I, there was something inside of me that said, no, Claudio, it's your responsibility. You need to put this out. You need to, there's a bunch of people out there who need to experience this. And it was never about money. It's, it, I don't think it's ever going to be about yeah. money. It's never going to be about money. Um, and and I, I just, I feel that, that, I hope that people, especially now post COVID, there's a lot of depression going on. I think that for that culture, the stuff that I'm putting out is bringing them hopefully some kind of joy, some kind of relief. Um, a lot of our people from my generation, I could see that they're struggling. It's hard. And I get all kinds of incredible DMs and contacts and people who are very emotional about the stuff that I'm I'm putting out. I don't have anything to do with it in the sense that I didn't create it. You yeah. know? It's, I don't really deserve the credit in regards to the content, but uh, uh accumulating it and putting it out and, and um curating it. I'm a curator. Yeah. Um is is uh is something that I take seriously. Um somebody out there appreciates the hell out of this stuff. And that includes the musicians, the VJs, the people who remember that that was a part of their life. It was VJs, important. man, those don't even exist no more. Right. But yeah, I've spoken to a couple of them and, and that was their life. They were young. And yeah. um they got. They ran through a lot of special people. They interviewed at the time. These people were rappers or R and Bs, but these are not. These are his people who were creating history. This is history that yeah. was happening. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't a musician. I mean, it's there. There are different levels of it, but you know, when um I forget his name, but one of the guys that interviewed Kanye West really early on, he hit me and we had a conversation, and um. He, he he interviewed he gave Kanye the first interview ever on MTV and I and I posted it in my first channel before it got taken down and um and he hit me he was like man this is a big moment and he didn't realize how big that moment was until now until he could reflect you feel me back then it's, oh, it's just Kanye it's a new guy let's just give him a chance and, okay let's interview him but you know Kanye ends up being Kanye and, yeah and doing the things that he does and that 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 interview now is is perceived differently, you know. You understand, and again, you see, as time passes, these memories they change shape, they change purpose, and, and that's a good example right there. And he, um, and that VJ, damn, I forget his name. He appeared in the Kanye West documentary just recently. Tori, there you go. Okay, it was him. Great he's guy. Like, he's a legendary like journalist. Right. Yeah. Right. I don't know much about him, but I remember seeing him all the time on TV. 
But he hit me and he wanted the video and I sent him the video, something I rarely do. But he deserves that video. Like, you're in it. That's your history. And I sent him that video. So um, that's a, that's an example right there of just how it morphs throughout time. And I appreciate that. And, again, it's my responsibility. Steph Lover, she hit me. Yo, can you send me the Nas interview? Yeah. You know, I sent her the Nas interview. It, was, it took some time, but I felt like Steph, that was her video. Like, Nas is, if Nas asks me, I'll give it to him. Mm-hmm. I don't own it. Apparently, Nas don't own it, but I don't. if I got it, I'll give it to whoever needs it. Like, it's y'all. So, um, I have, now it has become selfless. And I, now I have a, re- I feel like I have a responsibility. And that's why I'm continuing Hip Hop VCR, despite all the obstacles. Exactly. You know? Yeah. There are so many different YouTube channels and Instagram pages that are dedicated to posting rare music mm-hmm. footage and photos. How do you separate your content from other platforms? So, what what ended up happening is that my personality permeated through my content. Mm. And what you learn is that if you are yourself, if you're real, if you're connected, if you're in touch, no matter what you do, somehow your who you are is gonna is gonna show. And I think that I didn't I didn't show up on Hip Hop VCR for for a while for. Most of the channel's lifetime, people didn't know what I looked like, what I sounded like, or anything like that. But people were able to draw a, a picture of who I was. And so I think what stands out is that my personality somehow permeates through the channel, despite the fact that I'm not, for the most part, I don't appear on it often. And whether, maybe because I'm often, I often reply to comments, um, I'm engaging with the people, um, I'm, I'm, I'm approachable for some reason. People think that a platform like mine wouldn't be approachable. Like, or oh, I can't believe you responded to me. Like, I get that. Yeah. I'm not even famous. Like you wild. <laughs> like, like I'm not even like, like you, you like whatever. I got a DM. I'm gonna hit it back. Like yeah. what, what you need? Like, what's up? How can I help? You know? And so also, I also wanted to make hip hop VCR professional in some sort of way so i think that 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 makes us helps us stand out um i there was something else too um i wanted to give it this aesthetic right this vhs tape aesthetic kind of situation uh so everything was um geared in that direction so i gave it a brand i started branding hip-hop vcr this is something that I don't think that many people who were doing this were doing before I did it. Um, just kind of like overall branding this kind of stuff. Like, okay, the content is rough looking. It doesn't look like HD. So I'm going to I'm gonna go with that aesthetic. Like I'm going to, unperfection is good here. Yeah. You know, because nothing about a VCR and a VHS and the quality that we were recording, it was perfect. It's horrible yes. technology when you think back. But we're also in a time right now where a newer generation, younger than me and you, kind of appreciate that yeah. lo-fi kind of. I don't know if lo-fi is the term, but it's like this high quality, low quality stuff. Yeah. You know, and um, I like that. I like that it kind of swung back around where, like, I'm talking about younger than me. And yeah, like yeah. Teenagers now. Gen and, Z. Yeah, and even younger. I got a I got an eleven year old and that whole aesthetic of like lo fi, low quality stuff, they like that yeah. stuff. Um, that authenticity kind of situation. Cause now everything could be very H D and crisp. And so and so I wanted to go with that vibe with that aesthetic. So as I evolved the channel, I was going in that direction. So like making stuff professional like my logo, but also giving it like the V C R lines yeah. and some kind of lo-fi effect to it and um you know you know the first intro that i had i just changed my intro uh because um uh the guys at fresh out they made a new intro for me and people love it but before that it was me like popping in the tape the tape goes in the blue screen shows up if you know anything about vcrs that blue screen is gonna be familiar to you um, with the play button that shows mm-hmm. up. Like, these are all things that the, I think the people on the other end could tell that it was done intentionally. Yeah. And I think that when they saw that, they um, 
they took it more seriously. And it triggers that nostalgia too. Yeah. If you if you came up in the time of VHS. Yeah. 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 And keep in mind too. So um, when I first started posting on Hip Hop VCR, I was posting ten videos a day, and mm. there were guys who were hitting me, going, "Yo, my daily routine is waking up and like watching your joints, mm. right?" And so they go every time I see that tape pop in. I was excited. Yeah. So I had, you know, like when we grew up watching cartoons, like, you know, once that intro showed up for that cartoon, we were excited. Yeah. Like, oh, shit. Like, we're about to watch something new, whatever, whatever. So apparently I did that for for the for my viewers. Like, they were like, every morning, once that tape popped in, what were we going to watch? Is it Red Man? Is it Method Man? Is it yeah. Jay? Is it DMX? Is it Foxy? Is it Kim? And 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 and, and it's, it's awesome. So I think that whole kind of thing I created – just kind of like stood out to people and it, they gravitated to it and they loved it because I've gotten comments about it all the time. So, you know, oh, I love how professional your stuff is. And I guess nobody kind of did it at that level quite. Yeah. But hopefully I lead the way and we take it there, you know? I guess, and I guess uh, just going back to people liking that graininess, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, people love to see the care and the professionalism, but that at the same time, it's like, they know what they're getting into because mm -hmm. they know that it's archives. Right. So yes. you want it to look like how it looked yes. back then. Because even now I'm starting to see in uh, period pieces like different TV shows and movies that you know are shot now, but they're supposed to take place in like the 60s or something. Mm -hmm. Even the way, like um, Winning Time, the, the Lakers show. Sure, HBO, I haven't watched it. Okay, the ahead. way it's recorded, mm. it's recorded as if it's a camera from 1980. Got it, got it. Got so, you know. Yeah, they want to transport people yeah. to that time. Mm -hmm. And that's how we put our eyes on that stuff back then. And, you know, my brother made a great comment. You know, I, I'm a digital photographer. Yeah. But I also learned how to shoot film. Yeah. Um, and my brother said the difference, he made a great point, the difference between a digital camera and a film camera is that when you shoot film, it looks like a memory. Mm -hmm. It looks like a memory. While digital always looks present. Because it's so crisp, it's so sharp, it's so high quality, and he and I agree with him. So I could take a film shot right now in this room, and when we process it, it'll look like a memory, like immediately. It won't look like, I don't know how to say, it, like an Instagram capture. Like it'll look like a memory. So yeah, um, people like that. Mm -hmm. They like that memory kind of feeling to it. You know? Yeah. What it, what were or still are your influences? Hmm. Many. So I like to be influenced from the outside of. Okay, let me let me answer that. Simple. Okay, my influences are things outside of what I do. So yes, I play basketball. I'm not a professional basketball player. I never intended to be a professional basketball player, but I did play basketball, and I still do. But Michael Jordan influences me a lot in not basketball. Yeah. <laughs> Outside of basketball. Um, the way I conduct my business, the way I run my life. You know, you can learn from somebody. You know, I want to be the best at this. I want to be as good as in this as he was in that. So I'm influenced by stuff outside of what I'm doing. Jay-Z is another one. Um Apple and Steve Jobs, um, they influenced the design of my studio, my aesthetic. And I learned from those figures many things, nuances. Um, I don't, they teach me all the time, um, just just different things. And so I'm, I'm, I'm influenced in that way. Um, those, those are like the big Beyonce mm -hmm. stuff like that. I love Beyonce. Um, but artists, just like art in general, like I love, I'll, I'll be a commercial could influence me. Like I could see an aesthetic in a commercial and go, ooh, I, I'm a, I get that vibe. I want to do something with that vibe. I, I collect Vogue magazines. I love looking through Vogue magazines for like inspiration for anything, for photography, for yeah. editing, for all kinds of stuff. Some like, of the best photographies in Vogue, I would say. Yeah, for sure. and, and, and not only that, I also look at layouts. Yeah. Like, Photography is cool, but then I look at layouts, the way where fonts were put, text were put, and all kinds of stuff like that. Like, I love stuff like that. 
and commercials and you know I, I don't know I, I'm that kind of person I'm the I like I like aesthetics I like I like I like Kanye Kanye influences me a lot as well that's, that's a big one I miss fashion we love fashion in my family so there are many things that the influence but those are like the big ones right there that everyone would recognize mm-hmm. you know um, yeah but it's many things and are you able to capture all of that in um what you put out with the hip-hop vcr hmm. as much as i could because all that stuff culminates inside of me yeah and it it's been there a while i don't really know where it's coming from now now it's just a part of me um, you know, it, what? No, because I, all that, sh- all the stuff with hip hop VCR, it kind of went on auto with me. Like I didn't even have to think about it that much. It, it, it's more of just everything that is me that goes through hip hop VCR. I'm not really, I don't think I have even, um, drawn inspiration from anywhere else for hip hop VCR in any capacity. Um, so I, I'm sure it's in there somewhere, but it wasn't direct. Mm-hmm. So I'd have to think about something like that and see. Because, you know, sometimes we do things and don't understand them, and, and, and we have to dive in ourselves and look yeah. as to why we did this or why we did that. But if I, right off the bat, I go, nah, it just kind of went on automatic and just kind of moved forward. Everything I did with hip-hop VCR was fairly easy. It's just time consuming. Yeah. It's not difficult for somebody like myself to do what I did. It's just time consuming. Mm-hmm. Could you give a step by step process of how a person digitizes VHS footage? Because that, sure. in my whole life, I feel like that always <laughs> amazed me. Like, how do you take <laughs> a physical tape yeah. and then turn that into, you know, something that people can consume in a modernized medium? Right. I'm not an expert at it. I'm going to keep it real because I feel like a lot of the work has already been done for me. And what I mean by that is that there's software out there. I'm using a software, software slash hardware right now to, to convert my final tapes. But I did my, most of my um, conversions like over 10 years ago. Yeah. So all of my Michael Jordan games and all of my, um, most of my hip hop tapes. So I had 39 tapes that were on average between six to seven hours each mm. on average. So 39 tapes. Then I had miscellaneous tapes and those are the ones I'm converting now. Yeah. But those main tapes I converted over 10 years ago. And, um, again, it was the same situation back then. It was simply a software that came with a piece of hardware and I don't know the the terms for these items, but I'm sure that 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 hardware is similar to what you have here on your table. Some something that converts. Yeah. So it's something that I connected to my computer, and then that hardware I connected to the VCR. Pop in the tape. It played. It then transfer. I have to play the tape, and then it transfer converts it, and then it turns into whatever media I wanted. So MP4, this example, right? Or, or AVI, I think I did back then. Um, and and so if I have an eight-hour tape, I have to play the eight-hour tape, and it's being converted and being stored on my desktop, for example. Um, and now there are artists out there who convert professionally. I did a general conversion of these tapes. Um, if, if, if I was a professional or an artist at this, I would have converted them into some file type that would have that could have been um, restored better, you know. And so that's essentially how it is. Is this hardware software? I bought yeah. it on Amazon mm. both times, and and I'm currently doing it right now. So it's just connected to a Mac, and it's just like going and yeah. And then I archive it. You know, I name it, I tag it, and so it's easy easy to for me to search because I have a lot of stuff. And I do it in two-hour increments, so that way I don't have this huge file. Yeah. And also, if I fail mid, like if there's a corruption midway in an eight-hour conversion, I don't lose the whole thing. But if I do it in two-hour increments, then if one two-hour one fails, I just got to go back to mm-hmm. that and keep going. I, you know, so I would do that stuff overnight. So I'd go to sleep, press play on the VCR, start recording on the computer, go to sleep, wake up, 
and a whole tape would have been converted by then. Um, and then there's the process of then putting it on YouTube, which is finding, you know, four four files that are two hours each, which yeah. compile eight hours, and looking through there and finding um, footage for me to put on the channel and stuff like that, and then putting that in the software and cutting it up and all that. Yeah, thank you for that, because I, I definitely want to know that, and I'm sure people that's listening and watching this yeah. definitely want to know that, because it's just, you know, it's it seems tedious, and it seems not only tedious, but it's just kind of amazing to take that, you know, physical and convert it into... You know, even when I mean, I remember being little and thinking that like burning or like ripping music from a CD onto a computer or burning a CD was the most amazing thing. I agree, though. I yeah. had the same feeling about that. Yeah. So it's interesting that you bring that up. I remember doing that and feeling, yeah, this is amazing. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, again, but that work has been done for us already because there's software and stuff like that. The geniuses are the guys who did it and programmed it. Like, how do we do that? Like, how do you? You're right. But I, also in reverse, like how do we take a sound that a jazz a, a, a saxophonist and take that and digitize mm -hmm. it and then bring it through, uh, through a speaker? And as a kid, I'm like, does the speaker have all the instruments in it? Like, <laughs> to like, like, how are we getting this? Like, how do you put that on record? Yeah. Like, like you got to like burn that into like. Even to today, yeah. I'm, it's astounding. So it works both ways. Getting the physical, real life stuff onto the digital media, yeah. and then it gets archived for centuries. Yeah. It's incredible. You yeah. know, records and stuff and CDs. It's crazy. Real nerdy talk. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you have over 289 hours of VCR footage. Yes. Uh, how much of have have you uploaded on YouTube and Instagram so far? I'm probably still sitting at 35 to 40 percent mm. uh, that I have uploaded. It's hard to say, but that's the number I feel. So essentially, I still have 60 to 60 to 65 percent still that I could put out. Yeah. And um, and to put things into perspective, on my first hip hop ECR channel, which got shut down, is Hopefully, many people know. If you don't know, it got shut down because it got just it got way too popping. And Viacom, who owns MTV, BT, and YouTube, they shut it down, and because I violated a bunch of copyrights <laughs> and all that bullshit or whatever. But um, I, in six months, I had uploaded over six hundred videos on YouTube, and that's a lot. It's a lot. Um, so. And that again, so think about it. I that's thirty five percent. I have already put up six hundred videos. So even I mean, I have ninety nine pages of catalog, like pages, yeah, of just like Jay Z, DMX, Dr. Dre, Eminem, just like all cataloged. I organized it, and um, so th it's still a lot, it's still a lot. And with the new channel, I'm putting it out even slower. Yeah like one video every three days or something like that compared to 10 videos a day before like it's wild yeah you know so i'm back i'm baffled yeah i could go in there it feels like i'm gonna be there forever like i'm never gonna finish and then i'm not even i still got music videos i'm not counting the music videos wow. because i'm not allowed to put music videos yeah because people still getting paid for music videos feel me so can you imagine? Like, I'm sure I got music videos that nobody's ever seen before. Like, maybe only... I saw once or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sure I do, because I recorded mad stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just not allowed to put up music videos. But maybe one day I'll release all that stuff. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, when you were a kid, you know, you were recording the bulk of this in your teens. Yeah. You were a kid, and, you know, when growing up... Claudio is from Washington Heights. Yes. You've grown up in Washington Heights and you and your, your parents' crib and mm -hmm. you, you're you recording all this footage. Like, what was that What was that dedication like? And did you think that it was dedication back then when you were, or was it just the, the love and just the passion to, to just be like, I'm going to just record everything? Like, did you right. just sit down in front of VH1 and MTV and BET and actually be present while you were recording this footage or do you just let it rock and then just go do something else? Exactly. So you got it right. I let it rock. 
Yeah. Because I was out and about. Yeah. I was not stuck in front of the television. Um, I, I want, I, so I wanted to make sure, I'm trying to answer your first question here. So um, dedication, I definitely didn't perceive it as dedication back then. Because remember, while I'm recording all of this hip hop, I'm simultaneously recording all Michael Jordan games. <laughs> all Michael Jordan games. From 1994 all the way to 1998. Mm. Then when he came back from the Wizards, I subscribed to the to this package that I got to see all 82 of his games. Wow. And I recorded all of them from the two years that he was on the Wizards. With the Bulls, those four years, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, if you count all that, um, I recorded everything that was nationally broadcasted. So, like, there's games that they wouldn't air of Michael Jordan in New York. Uh, so, but many Jordan games were. So I'm recording a bunch of Michael Jordan games, and then almost everything that I could from hip-hop on TV, from any channel. So um, I had a system where I would record, um, I would know when um, something was going to air, and I would program my VCR and go, okay, it has to record from from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. I would come home and then rewatch it and go, okay, yeah, I'm gonna keep this. Then I would put I would re-record that on a on a on the main tape where all my other stuff is at. And then erase this tape later. So yeah. I had a tape dedicated to just recording when I wasn't around. And I recorded in what's called SP, which is the highest quality you could record. But when you recorded in SP, it took up less space. Yeah. More sorry, more space on the tape, and so I will when I when I recorded something in SP and I liked it, I would then re-record it on my other tape an EP, yeah, which gave me more space so that way I could fit more into an eight-hour tape. Um, so most of the time, honestly, I was not sitting in front of the television because I was popping. I was out and about. <laughs> I wasn't like the nerd. I wasn't like sitting in, in the, in like I was like, I was, I was out balling, playing basketball. I was out working, getting money. I was out hanging out with friends. I was doing everything a normal person would do, but I was, I had that VCR on program and notes on my television going, don't touch the television <laughs> or, you know, because if somebody came and turned on the television, it's over. It's over. You know, and and I'm sure that that happened a couple of times, but that's probably where the note came from. Like, yo, let's not let this happen again. Yeah. Like, we're not doing this. So, so I was I recorded about half of it. I probably wasn't there. Now, if I came home from work or wasn't working or came home from school, um, and I so happened to be there, I would watch 106 and Park or I would watch Rap City. Um, but also, let's say there was an artist that would appear in Rap City that I didn't like. Yeah, I was off that day. <laughs> I'm not recording. I'm out. I don't got to do shit today. Yeah. Same thing in 106 and Park. If they had anybody who I didn't like. And also keep in mind that, you know, there's wh while I'm watching something, they're already promoting the next couple episodes. Yeah. So I already knew ahead of time, oh, Jay-Z is going to be on 106 and Park on Friday. Yeah. It's Wednesday or Tuesday. And I already, oh, so I already got to start planning my, my Friday. This is going to be a big deal. Yeah. And I would rather be there watching it live than record it. But, hey, if I got, if I got to be somewhere, then I'm a, I'm just going to record it, program the VCR, and and take care of it later. Um, but, um, yeah, man, I was out and about. I wasn't going to let that stop me from, yeah. like, enjoying my life and, like, being out there and getting in trouble and shit. So that's how that's how it happened. Um, dedication, not I could perceive it now as dedication. Yeah. But back then, it was just life. For me. Yeah. And so I lived a secret life. Nobody knew that I was doing this. Hmm. Like, and I was popular everywhere I went. So people didn't know that I was home archiving, like, wild stuff. Like, and nobody, I mean, I learned that some people ended up doing it, but nobody did it as prolific as I did, apparently. So that that's how I went down with me with that. Um, I, it was dedication and subcapacity for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was passion, though. Yeah. I loved it. Definitely passion for yeah, sure. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. You ever you ever worry about running out of footage? No, I look forward yeah. to running out of footage. 
I want to finish. Let me tell you something. My original plan for Hip Hop VCR was to put out 30-minute clips on YouTube of whatever it, I captured. So that means, I'm going to give you an example. If I have an eight-hour tape, that first half hour, I will just publish it on YouTube. This is what, this was my plan. So essentially, I would get 16 videos out of this eight-hour tape and let it be and let that shit go. I didn't care about views, subscribers. I just wanted to put it out. Again, because my goal was to get rid of it. I, my responsibility was to put it out. How I put it out, I didn't care. I just needed it to go out. Of course, the moment, and I did load a fir, my first half hour um, um, clip of tape one, and it got like 60 fucking copyright. Because it, there was like Tupac music videos, Wu-Tang music videos, <laughs> Dr. Dre music, and I didn't know shit about none of this yeah. copyright. I'm just like 30 minute, here we go, 30 minute, and my shit got blocked, and I was like, and then I stopped for a year. So I, I started Hip Hop VCR, like officially people knew about it in 2021 November, but I started it like over a year before that. Yeah. But when I saw that I got copyright, I was like, oh, I'm done. What's the point of this? Like it's hmm. over. So so I look forward to being done, bro. Like I'm not, you know, like I want to do my duty. Uh, and hey, if this evolves into something else and you know, like like many people don't know this, but I, I want I'm I want to start a podcast for hip hop VCR. So it might it might evolve and yeah. take it somewhere. I might end up making some money from this, maybe, maybe not, who cares? But 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 my goal was always just to dump the footage and get rid of it. So if I'm done tomorrow and I and I and it all went out and it's out in the universe, I did my job and I'm good. Yeah. And I could disappear, bro. Like I'm good. Like yeah. You know, that's the way I see it. It's not about me. It's about the footage and the yeah. stuff. But it seems like people want to know somewhat about me. Obviously, you're here. You're talking yeah. to me. And, and 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 you're not the first. So, it, obviously, people want to know what's behind it. And I respect it. I get yeah. it. So, What technical difficulties did you come across? I mean, you told me about how somebody might have probably recorded over it. Uh, you, you know, when you – so you write a note on the TV, mm -hmm. like, don't touch the TV. Sure. But, uh, yeah, what technical difficulties do you come across with this footage? Because a lot of it is between 17 and 25 years old. And when you say technical difficulties, you're saying at the time when I'm recording them or after when I'm starting to archive it? Um, or both? Or both, yeah, just back then. Got you. I'll give you some examples. Technical difficulties from the beginning are going to be, yes, you program your VCR. <laughs> You, you you come home, you pop in the tape that you programmed it, and there's a novella, a novel <laughs> being played, or like something, or you could literally see somebody flicking through the fucking channel. Like, then they stop and they watch, uh, you know, a sitcom or some shit. And I'm sure that that happened once or twice, but not any more than that, because I'm not going to let that happen multiple times. Um, but that's a technical difficulty right there. Um, and that's frustrating, because, you know, Hopefully, whatever that was, I don't remember what it was. It wasn't a, it wasn't like a Jay Z interview or something like that. But that's one. A second one is misprogramming a VCR. You think you programmed it for three p.m., but maybe you programmed it for three a.m. Mm. Uh, forgetting to pop the tape in for the, for for the the, the programming. Um, these are all things that are familiar to me, so I'm sure that they've happened to me. Extremely frustrating, but from that comes lessons, and you go, I got to tighten it up so stuff like this don't happen. So luckily it didn't happen often, and I got most of the stuff. Other technical <coughs> issues, excuse me, um, ripped tapes. Oh, damn. If the VCR decides to fucking eat your tape. That was the worst. Yeah, man. And you got to yank this fucking tape out. And in order to get the tape out, you're going to You have to destroy tape. it. Yeah. Yeah. And me and my brother became like VHS tape surgeons. So like you get this VHS tape and you know the stuff that's on it is super important, but you unscrew it and there's springs in there and aluminum pieces and shit that are all very important. Yeah. You want to take that stuff out, put it all aside. Then you got the actual tape. Yeah. Then you got to go get a donor tape. 
for the case. Yeah. So like, okay, this tape is no good. So like, this is garbage. So we're gonna take this tape out of here. Then we're gonna get this tape and put it here. Then this goes. Then we got um, and this is if something is wrong with this case. But then if your tape has a rip, I don't, anyone who dealt with this would know. You tape it on both sides. You tape the tape, and anything on that the adhesive tape. You're gonna lose that footage. It could be 25 seconds. It could be a minute, but at least you got the rest of the stuff. And so that stuff used to happen. Um, and so those anyone who dealt with VHS and VCRs, they're familiar with that. Uh, VH VCRs eating your fucking tape. The sound of that of just like the crackling and crinkling, like your tape is caught up in. Feel there. like your life is over. <laughs> oh, another thing you would do is open up the VCR and try and get the tape out without losing it. And sometimes, man, that VCR just ate your shit. Um, so that happened. Fixing VCRs, like we were technicians, man. You open the shit, you press this shit, then you know, okay, that that helps it play better. Then you got it's just weird shit. Yeah, kind of like stuff like that. Um, then later on. In converting, I didn't really run into many technical aspects. I mean, you're dealing with a computer, so you're talking about that you're trying to convert, you know, eight hours, and then you record eight hours, then you go the next morning to check it, and then the audio is off sync. Mm. Eight hours, just like, it's just not synced. So then you have to reboot the computer, restart the software, do it over, and it will kind of, and to today, that still happens to today in the newer software that I'm using, where it just don't sync. Either the computer's cache is too full and the memory is all fucked, or, or you haven't rebooted in, like recently. But a reboot usually fixes all that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, and so those technical issues there, um, not many on on this end, but in the beginning when I'm recording this stuff years ago, you're dealing with mechanical VCRs and stuff like that and these, 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 these tapes, and you're going to have issues, you know. But there's always a way to fix it. So that was the beautiful thing. And yeah. We had to learn quick or lose everything we just did. So, And that's a mentality with any creative, man. You just got to have the mentality that anything can be fixed. Yes. Once you have that mentality, then, you know, it'll it'll lead you in a direction of of uh, continuing to do what you're, whatever you're doing. Yeah, man. You got to be a problem solver. Yeah. You got to be. have to. You, you got to adapt quick. And in my business, I'm the number one problem solver. Yeah. Every day there's a problem. It's beautiful though. Yeah, I love it. If you got problems in your life, that means you got problems to solve. That means you're busy. It means you're learning too. Yeah, man. So human beings love solving puzzles. If you ain't solving puzzles, you're fucked. I don't yeah. know what to tell you. You yeah. need to be solving puzzles daily. Mm -hmm. When you were recording and acquiring all this footage between '97 and '05, did you ever say to yourself, "One day I'll release all this footage"? Never. I watch it. Yeah, I watch it. Never did I go. N none of the Michael Jordan stuff, none of the <coughs> excuse me, hip hop, uh, hip hop stuff. Never. No, it was never my intention. I, first of all, I couldn't foresee then that there would be a demand for this stuff. I didn't. I I, I didn't assess that other people would like this as much as I did, because if you did, you would have recorded it like I did. So obviously I liked it enough to, 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 to archive it and, and, and do it ultra professionally, even back then when I was a kid. No, I never, never, never intended, you know, maybe like, okay, I'll show it to my brother and maybe my friends, but never on, I mean, I couldn't foresee YouTube. I couldn't foresee a digital platform where videos would be prominent. No, I never, never, never. I did it all for myself. hundred percent, man. 80, I did it for 80 year old myself. Yeah. So I could die on my bed. Yo, like, I'm going to die. I might as well just sit here and just, like, watch all this shit. Like, <laughs> go out like that. You know, that's the way I see it. Like, you know, and that's, yeah. why, that's how I did it, and that's why I did it, to be yeah. honest. That's it. Yeah. So back in April of this year, you released the footage of Jay-Z's full 2001 High 97 Summer Jam right. performance. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that anyone had ever had access to that performance right. unless you were actually in attendance. Right. When you released the footage, were you aware that people have never seen this footage? And did you say to yourself, this is the video that will blow up this channel? Nope. Yeah. I did not at all. I was actually sitting on this couch when it happened. So every morning I would upload videos. I still do. When I when I upload, I upload at 10 a.m. Yeah. The reason is because that's the time that I leave to come to my photo studio. So right before I leave, 
my my videos are scheduled. So like that video, to give some context, by the way, for those who don't know, I I do I did I, I do well, I do themes on some weeks. So that week I had a theme, and it was Jay Z versus Nas week. And I was excited because I'm a huge Jay-Z fan. Yeah. I love Nas. And I was kind of, I, I was curating a bunch of magazine uh, um, scans in conjunction with videos every week, every day that week that had to do with the Jay-Z versus Nas beef of 2001, 2002, right? And so it was going to be, it's a seven-day event, and it was going to be, one day Nas, next day Jay, then Nas, then Jay, and then the last day, which was going to be Sunday, was going to be both of them, right? And that video was supposed to be, which I did air, was going to be when they reconciled, when they were like, okay, we're cool yeah. now, it's cool, yeah. like they grew up. In 06. Yeah, remember. exactly. So it, it, it all came back to that. But so, so Nas interviews when he's promoting Stomatic, clippings of like, Nas talking about Jay, Jay talking about Nas, and so the 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 the, the sec the the fourth day I think was like okay yeah I think it's relevant I think I should put the Summer Jam joint because he this is Nas on Takeover for the first time on now keep in mind I had already seen the Summer Jam footage because I've had it for twenty one years so I didn't know that nobody had it so I didn't know it was gonna blow up my channel to answer your question I didn't know. So it's 10 a.m. That video is scheduled. It posts. I get in my car, come to my photo studio. I'm in the middle of a photo shoot. Yeah. I had a scheduled client that day. I had a small break because I think the clients were changing outfits or whatnot in my photo studio. And I sit right on this very couch, and my phone is blowing up. Like, I had never seen that before. I know what celebrities feel like now. They must be turning off all these notifications because this shit is killing your battery. Yeah. Like this shit, your screen is lighting up. And if you have it on vibrator on some of these apps, there is shaking. Yeah. And so your joint is running out of batteries. So my shit is going nuts. And not only is it going nuts because people are liking, people are hitting me up directly. Like journalists, uh, uh, radio personalities, uh, uh, um, um, bloggers are hitting me. All this is happening on this couch. I'm like, bro, what the fuck is happening? And 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 people's like, yo, bro, you the you the goat of this, you <laughs> the goat of this. And, and by that point, people already like my platform, but now I'm goaded. Yeah, like they're like, yo, you the goat, you the yeah. goat, because they're like, yo, this guy got footage that nobody's seen before. And coincidentally, obviously, it's tied into Nas and Jay Z, some of the biggest figures in our yeah. culture. And we're I'm, I'm talking about it just went nuts. And I'm like, yo, sweetie. This shit is going viral. Like, I'm going viral. And we're in the middle of this photo shoot, bro. And I just keep looking at my Apple Watch. because, And then I just keep getting notifications, notifications, notifications. But I didn't know I didn't know that I was going to blow up like that. And that very same day was the day that Peter Rosenberg hit me up. So I'm in the middle of the photo shoot, photographing. And he's DMing me, and I'm responding to him in the <laughs> middle of the photo shoot. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, <laughs> hot, And then Hot 97 hit me up. Like independently, like Rosenberg hit me, yeah. but Hot ninety seven hits me up, that it DMs me directly, because you know it's Hot Night, it's Summer Jam, Hot ninety seven, yeah. so they hitting me up on the same day, or journalists, um, um, or just everybody, just everybody. I'm not good with names, so I, that's a bunch of famous people that yeah. hit me, and I'm like, I don't know, I know they're famous, but I just don't know who they are, or <laughs> care to know their names enough. I'm sorry. But the shit went off, bro. And um, I forget it. The rest of the week was just fucking. Yeah. It was incredible. It was incredible. You know, and then a couple of days later, Jay-Z gets word about it. Then he hits back. He comments about the video. And I'm like, that's it. We went all the way, baby. Yeah. And more than anything, I was like, oh, that's cool. Jay saw it. And he. But I was like, yo, babe, that means Beyonce saw it. <laughs> yo, we hit. We lit. It's over. Beyonce put her eyes on hip hop VCR. Like, that's it. Yeah. Like, there's no way she didn't. Yeah. And so I was just joking about that. And I was like, I think it's kind of, I think that's kind of cool that that, that kind of went down. It was never about me, but that's where all the media stuff happened. That's where people wanted to know who I was, where the fuck this thing came from. And the interviews ensued after that. Like, that's where, 
and here we are today. You, you know, yeah. I'm still getting interviewed about yeah. it, and it's it's kind of crazy about it, but never didn't see it coming. Yeah, because I didn't know that it was unseen. Yeah, I didn't know. Well, how ninety seven hit you up? I mean, because you know that's their IP. <laughs> Yeah. Like, so what what would, what did they say? Nah, man, they were cool about it. Man. Oh, for real? Yeah, they were. They never pressed me on anything. They never copyrighted it. I don't know if they could. Maybe they could and they didn't. Yeah. But it's good. I, I give them shout outs because uh, it's it's about the culture. It is bigger than Hot ninety seven. It's bigger than Jay Z. It's bigger than hip hop VCR. It was bigger than me. So the fact that they let it ride, I think I got to give it to them because. You know, I guess they could have been assholes about it. In fact, they were they were asking me if they could post it. Mm. <laughs> they, and I was <laughs> like, yeah, go ahead. I don't I don't care. So they had asked me if they could post it and and uh, and then I think um Peter Rosenberg um and the other two Hot 97 people um Ebro, Ebro and then Laura. Yeah. They had a, they did a video on YouTube where they they kind of talked about it real quick, the video. And I think that's what they had asked me permission for, so they could put it on that video. Mm -hmm. So I gave them verbal consent. We didn't have to sign anything. I mean, I don't really feel like I own it anyway. Yeah. I have it, but I don't I don't think anybody should own it. I think everybody. I think it belongs to everybody. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm putting it out, right? Um, and, and, and so they had asked me for permission. And even furthermore, when S Summer Jam happened this year, um, they hit me again. Yeah, asked me for permission to highlight the video. Yeah, on their social media, and they did. And I, you know, like they're great, gracious. Like they're asking me for permission. Meanwhile, they could rip it off YouTube and like, and they put it with my logos and everything. Like they, they cool. Mm. They like, yeah, promote it. And it's it's awesome. Um, High Ninety Seven has been with it. I, I really appreciate them for that. Yeah, because it's something that I would do. Like it's all about the culture. It's not about who owns this or making money or whatever and they let it ride and i love that and it's like a full circle moment because you grow up grow up listening to high 97 so facts yeah you know it's kind of surreal mm -hmm. i'm sure mm -hmm. do you think the attention you received from from releasing that performance was almost a gift and a curse no pun intended because yeah no both <laughs> right, right. yeah uh because shortly thereafter the channel mm -hmm. was shut down by viacom cbs and youtube 100 percent. it's the reason why it got shut down it amassed so much attention so quickly that it hit their radar. It hit everybody's radar. It hit Jay's radar. So it hit, it, 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 like, you know, the video went viral, but in our community, in our culture. Yeah. So it went viral there. So if pl planet Earth is a circle, it only went around on one, one pixel. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Everywhere else, it's not really relevant. It's like the culture. I think it circled the planet as long as you were a part of the hip-hop culture and community. So we went viral that way. That's how that video went viral. And it went viral enough that the, the quote-unquote owners of other copyrighted material that I was posting, not even that video. Ironically, that's the only video that I post that I have copyrights to, that I own. Wow. The Ironically. Ir the irony, yeah. Yeah. Everything else is owned by somebody else. And most of it, when it came to MTV, BET, and VH1, is um, owned by Viacom. So he definitely, definitely felt like it had something to do with it, and it hit their radar. And they just saw that I was, like, owning <laughs> all the BET content. Yeah. And I think they... they specifically were after the diaries you know the mtv the, yeah the mtv diaries dmx that's where i got hit all my copyright got hit with all the diaries and i think it's because they're planning to re-release them mm. and they wanted that stuff offline so they could generate income mm. from it on their paramount on platform so from what i understand from the little i've heard that might be the reason why they hit me with all the copyrights on the diaries so it's all the diaries while they were at it, they were like, fuck it, shut the whole shit down. And they wow. went after everything. They went after everything. So what? One, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say, when I relaunched the, the new channel, Hip Hop VCR 2.0, the first video I uploaded, which was the only video technically I'm allowed to upload, was the 
the the the summer jam joint. Yeah. And um and I did and I did that immediately after Hip Hop VCR 1.0 got shut down because again that video belongs out there. Like yeah, I got shut down, but like let's put that video back out. Yeah. Because it needs to be out there. It's important for the times and I put it out. And then I and then I got off Hip Hop VCR for like a couple months and that was the only video on there. And now I'm kind of back up and going and still posting uncopyrighted, I mean copyrighted stuff, but just taking it easy. Yeah. yeah. Not going ham like yeah, I yeah. did the first time around. Yeah. And I'm definitely not posting any MTV, BT, or VH1 stuff owned by Viacom. Like, yeah. None of that stuff. Yeah. This that's hard now because I mean these uh these these corporations these monopolies they you don't know what they own and what they don't own. I know <laughs> it's true. You're right. And I had no idea that they own all that stuff. Yeah. Would you be more upset if they just took down the uh, driven content and not all the other stuff? Would I have? I mean, I would have rather that. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't like the fact that the channel got shut down. I mean, yeah. It had accumulated so many subscribers, and 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 it went. I went from eleven thousand five hundred to zero. You feel me? And I had put in a lot of work uh, during that time. I had done a lot of development for the platform. Including starting a merchandise website and, and and selling stuff so I could be compensated for the time. I had bought a new MacBook to mm. to co- to deal with the the video editing aspect of it. I needed a, a new. I was due for a new MacBook. Yeah. So that was the that took it over the edge. I was like, yeah, if I want hip hop VCR to go, I'm gonna invest in this machine. So I bought a three thousand, almost a four thousand dollar MacBook Pro, so I could deal with the footage. You know, and um, you know, I would have rather. I don't understand the logic. Like, why not just take the videos down? And but they, they, they um, disciplined by just yeah. destroying the channel. Like, and on top of it, they destroyed my TikTok, which was picking up speed. I was also putting clips on TikTok, but then Instagram doesn't have that policy, which is great. They all Viacom also went into my IG and took down a bunch of MTV beats. Scrubbing the internet. That's fine. But then Instagram was like, okay, cool. Yeah. You can keep going with your platform though, because everything else is still yeah. good. But YouTube doesn't have that policy. So I kept going with IG, which is great. IG just kind of took the videos down and I kept my subscri- my followers and it was all good. Yeah. It just seems like more of a logical situation, right? Yeah. So that that would have been the best case scenario right there. But unfortunately you know, we don't own the platform. And yeah. We also don't own our own history, apparently. Mm. That's our history, right? All that stuff. Yeah. I don't care who recorded it. Yeah. I don't care who got paid, who didn't get paid. It's our history. That's history. And y'all wilding, saying that y'all own it and y'all could control it and shit. Like, I don't know. You know, on a quick note, I'm a professional photographer. And most photographers own the rights to the photos that they take. Mm-hmm. So if you come to my studio and you hire me, you pay me to photograph you, and I photograph your baby, I own those photos. Yeah. You paid me, and I own the photos. Yeah. That's the policy. That's the rules. In a court of law, I would win that. But in my in my world, I go, nah. Yeah. You own those. And I give you all the photos. And if you want to make your baby famous with my pictures, the pictures that I took of your baby, and you become a zillionaire, I don't want a penny. And you paid, they paid you already. Right, so. but that 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 favors the photographer. So in in my world, I, I'm not with that. I mean, if I photograph your baby and your grandma and all that stuff, I said that's your photos. Yeah, that's your history. I, for me to hold that back from you and say that you can't have it or you need to pay me extra or that I don't understand that because that's your history. You help my business by hiring me, but this is bigger for you. This mm-hmm. is your history. This is your grandmother. She might not be here one day. And and so if people clients come and they go, yo, Claudio, can I lost my photos? Can you send them again? Absolutely. Here you go again. How much? Nothing. They're your photos. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm storing them on my hard drives. I'm paying for hard drives. But no, I don't. I don't. I don't understand that. But you know, that's again, that's my philosophy, and and that's the same philosophy with me with this footage. Like I don't care who recorded. Yeah, I think y'all own it. Y'all can say on paper, y'all say y'all own it, but no, that belongs to the universe. And that's just my philosophy on it. And that's yeah. why I do what I do, how I do it. That's yeah. That's why I do it. You know? That's yeah. It's our shit right there. Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, what do you think can be done collaboratively with you and these corporations in, in that same video? Um, where you, you know, you talked about in a video um, on your second hip hop VCR platform yes. 2.0. Yep. Uh, you were addressing um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the page getting shut down. So, yeah. what do you think can be done collaboratively with you and these corporations? Because you are more upset for the viewers of the content, right? Rather than for yourself. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, the answer to that question is anything could be done. As matter as, as as long as people get together and talk and get creative and collaborate, when you don't when you don't create that forum, nothing will happen. I don't I don't believe that it's impossible for two people to sit down and work something out. Yeah. So for me, it's it's the, it's, it's the, there's no ceiling. Anything could be done. Let's just get creative. I could come up with a, literally a million things that could be done collaboratively. You know, they could win off of me. And I could keep go doing what I'm doing. I could put their logo on all that shit. Whatever. You know, um, they could, I could be their liaison in this underground kind of like world for like, Hip hop archiving and stuff like that. You feel me? Like I could be. It's kind of like you remember the radio stations. You got you got um, the main DJs, maybe the Funk Master Flex and stuff like that, and they're playing their stuff from like yeah. five p.m. to eight p.m. Mm -hmm. But then around like ten p.m., you got like the underground DJ that kind of K Slay and them, right? Yeah. And you gave them like an hour or two or whatever, whatever, right? Like there's tears to this, right? On the same platform. You feel me? Like Hot ninety seven was a platform. And they have tears of their shit. And it's like, okay, in the late night, we'll do like the DJ underground joints. Where, you know, some DJs will break this artist maybe from the South. So stuff that wouldn't be as popular right now. But Funk Flex is going to play the new J joint. All the DMX stuff. All the J, all the Jada Kiss. While this underground DJ is going to play some, some stuff that's not quite known yet. Right? They could have done some kind of structuring like that. But these people, they're not that creative. They don't come from our culture. They're not us, you know. They don't. They 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 think very um binary. No mm -hmm. streaming service. This and all of this could have been incorporated. We could have all won, you know. I had already created a level of buzz. Of course, I don't have a million people looking at me yet, but you know, there's this momentum and this trajectory, like where where it was going, you know. And they and the fact that they're not connected to our culture is what allowed them that insensitivity you feel me like if it was like if somebody like me happened to old viacom i definitely would have approached that situation differently even if i'm a billion gazillionaire even if i have lawyers behind me yeah. like at the end of the day the el the human element is what it boils down to mm -hmm. otherwise why are we doing this who are you doing this for like it's the human element like who who are your buyers who are your sellers who are your people it's the human element and humans have ears and yeah. brains and eyes and senses mm -hmm. it's like and you could you could um control that by simply saying hi to somebody talk. like and so they could easily organically i mean come on man anyone creative could could see right through that like but again the fact that they're not connected to the culture sorry could you say that sorry again? that's my siri right there uh they <laughs> weren't connected to the culture um it's what allows them not to feel that they need to talk to somebody like me, like, like I'm a nobody to them, yeah. like whatever. But I'm a I'm a somebody, you know. I'm a I'm do I'm I'm doing something that nobody ever did. You feel me? And so give me that respect. Mm -hmm. Give me a word. Yeah. Give me a meeting. Give me a phone call. Mm -hmm. But they didn't disrespect me. They disrespected our culture, yeah. our community when they did that. And um, I hope I exposed it. To be honest, yeah. So, we need to own our shit. Yeah. Whatever we do. Yeah. You know, you need to own your shit. You own your shit. Like, let's keep it that way. You know, like no matter what. Yeah. Like take take ten thousand instead of a million if they want this. Yeah. As long as it means yeah, you keep it. You feel me? Like, cause you'll get the million later. So take the ten now. Fuck it. You know that's that's how I see it. Um. And unfortunately, just that, that's just how I rolled. And 
we could have figured something out. That's the answer to your question. Anything could have been possible. Anything. Yeah. That's how easy it would have been. One word. Let's go. Let's talk. What is it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, they could have seen that I'm a sensible individual because I was already online doing interviews. Yeah. I'm not a crazy guy. Like, you feel me? Like, yeah. I'm well-spoken. Like, you know, this is this is a guy you could talk to. Yeah. Sensibly. But they obviously didn't care. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. What was so special in hip-hop between 1997 and 2005 that made you want to archive everything you possibly could? Nothing was special. That was just my era. That's oh. Where, <laughs> that's where I yeah. was at. That's... I didn't know it was special. Yeah. It was just happening in front of me. So if, it, if if I was in the 80s, it would have been the same situation. If I was now. So I think me and you were talking something to this effect before we started on the yeah. podcast. But it's like, you know, that's my era. You mm-hmm. feel me? Because I was awake. Yeah. Awakened during that period. That's when I was growing up. There's kids today having a very similar experience in hip-hop, in the culture, during their time. they It's not their fault they weren't 15 in 1997. Yeah. That's not their fault. They're, they're 15 in 2022. And and so when they hear, uh, uh, you know, this music right now, they might, there's kids who feel just like I did back then. So there was honestly nothing special about it. The people who find that era special are the people who experienced it. Yeah. And there's rarities. You, you're at the edge because you're, you know, you're younger than me. But there's even guys younger than you, yeah, who appreciate that era. But they're a minority. Yeah, let's keep it real, right? Our era belongs to us. The KRS One era belongs to the KRS One era. The 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 five O. I I, forget, I don't know how to say his name, but like, you know, all these new artists and stuff like that. These guys, it's their era now. Fabio. Fabio. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, it's it's their time, it's their era. And, now, you know, it moves a lot faster now than it yeah. did when we were younger. Because somebody could be popping today, and then, you know, somebody else is popping two months from now who's the biggest of the biggest. The baby went from, you know, the biggest of the biggest to trying to come back. And it's, been, <laughs> it's only been like two years. Meanwhile, Jay-Z had a whole eight to nine year straight run of albums. You feel me? Every single year. Every single year. Um the baby has a comeback story within a two year span of his of his of his <laughs> not, not his entire career, but you know once he blew up and, sh- and stuff. So it moves a lot faster now, and so it's, it is different in that way. But there was nothing special about it. It was special to me. It was special at the time. We experience it differently when it's present, when you're there. Yeah. Um, and even if you're young and you're experiencing. My era, um, and let's say you 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 today, and, you, and you're and you going back to learn about the era, you know, the, the 90s and early 2000s, you're going to experience that very different. It was visceral for us. Yeah. Like, we were there. Like, I, like, when Jay dropped Takeover, like, I remember that feeling. No, nobody can ever yeah. experience that unless you were there. When Nas drops Ether, Everyone who was there remembers the feeling of that. When Jay would drop a freestyle, when Jay, you know, when when DMX first came out, I wrote a blog about it, like my experience. It's on my website um, where I speak about the first time I heard DMX. It was a special moment. I'm going to write about the first time I heard Big Pun, um, the first time I heard Eminem. You feel me? Like, and so, but somebody who's 20 years old today, you can't understand it. So for every person, your era is the most special thing in the world. It's There's something about that age range is what it is. You know, once you're like 15 and... When you really start falling in love with yeah. the, whatever culture is yeah. prevalent. Yeah. yeah. Fashion, sneakers, yeah. sports, music, um, girls, school, the smell of school, the smell hmm. of... Of paper, the smell of a magazine, the smell of of pizza is different. Like you feel me? So it's all it's all relative. It's yeah. all relative. I, I don't want to sit here and think that my era was the greatest ever in the world. Yeah, I can't tell you. I don't know. It was the greatest era I ever experienced. Yeah, but I can't tell it to a twenty year old. And I also, you know what? 
I also can't tell that to like a guy from you know who love Karis one and all that stuff. I'm not a big fan of those guys before all the, anyone before Nas, Biggie, Jay Z, Tupac, <laughs> and Wu Tang. Like I'm, I don't rock. I'm sorry, I just don't. Um, I didn't like that type of rap. I never liked it. I'm not, not, I'm not like El Cool is like right there. Like he, he, he came towards the end of that Karis one kind of like hip hop Bronx era. Yeah. But then he kind of is also modern, like in that Jay Z kind of. But I was never a big fan of, uh, uh, you know, um, I just didn't like that type of hip hop, that kind of like old school kind of rap. Um, and I'm so, but those guys from that era didn't like the new era coming. Yeah. And I remember hearing them talk about it, like Jay Z talk about drugs and shit, <laughs> fucking Tupac getting shot and shit. What kind of shit is that? You know, <laughs> our legends don't get shot and shit. And it's like, meanwhile, Tupac looked up to Karis. Mm -hmm. Jay-Z looked up to Big Daddy Kane and those guys. So, like, you guys kind of have something to do with it. Like, these are drug dealer street guys who like your music. And then they go, let me turn to music. But these are real hip-hop guys. These are actual, like... Carol's one is an actual rapper. Jay Z is a hustler who raps, bro. Like, you know, a lot of Ti and yeah. Rick Ross and Tupac and Biggie. Biggie is a street guy. You feel me? Like he was in the corner, like hanging out. Yeah. And shit, you know. But Carol's one is like a hip hop guy. You feel me? Hip hop only. Only. Yeah. Like, these guys weren't drug dealers. They most of them they weren't hustlers. They were not street guys. They were like rappers. You know. And at, during that time, there was a big difference between us. Rapper and a street guy. And the street guys made more money than the rappers. Yes, and the street guys will talk shit and make yeah. fun of the hip-hop guys because the hip-hop guys will go on tour and travel and come back with no money. <laughs> and the street guy would be in the same corner and be shopping at Dapper Dan's, you know? And 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 and, and those guys, that era, they talked down on my era when that, my era was starting. So I made sure not to do that yeah. later, like, you know, I'm not. I'm not gonna be like, yeah, Jay Z. Yo, yo, fuck y'all artists. Jay Z's the best. Jay Z's not gonna be the best one day. Yeah. Michael Jordan's not gonna be the best one day. <laughs> There's a bunch of kids out there who go. LeBron James is the best. Steve, uh, uh, Steph Curry is the best. Kyrie Irving is the best. Okay, uh, they're gonna forget about Jordan one day, and it's all good. That's just how life goes. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It just is what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you archived anything past 2005? Hip hop, yeah, or anything. Yes, yeah. the rest of my life. Okay, <laughs> my what, children. What about hip hop? Let me think. So I collect MP3s. Okay, files. So it might sound weird, right? Maybe not to you, but just think about to a streaming uh, a kid who yeah. only streams music. Yeah, they don't download nothing. They don't download nothing. So keep. So I to today, I'm downloading MP3s. Today, uh, Beyonce released her new album, Renaissance, and I downloaded that joint. Yeah. I have the MP3s. So I still, so I, I I like collecting the MP3s. I like having the file on my computer. Yeah. Um, I also stream, don't get it wrong, but I like the file. I want the file. I want to own the file. So let's think more openly. I am still archiving. In this case, I'm archiving MP3s. I archive YouTube videos about hip hop. So if Complex News, DX News, um, if there's a, a documentary that was put out about Kanye West, about his sneakers, or about um, or about his, or about how my beautiful Dr. Twisted Fantasy changed the game, or or, or 808 Heartbreaks Changed the Game. Like, there's independent guys on YouTube creating documentaries about this that are great, and I rip them. I rip them, and I store them on my computer. So now, 20 years from now, if YouTube changes drastically or something radical happens, and let's say these videos aren't around or 30 years from now, I'm going to have a whole nother archive of this era, and I'm still doing it. So, yes, I am archiving YouTube videos right now, MP3s right now. What else am I archiving? That's all I could think. Of. Not much physical media like magazines. I used to archive magazines, obviously, yeah. in the 90s. Nothing too physical right now that I could think of. I still collect sneakers, but mostly Yeezys. 
I used to collect Jordan, so I, I'm gonna keep all my Yeezys. They're part of history yeah. and they're part of hip hop history. Uh, no matter what people feel about them, like you have to put things into perspective. Like Kanye started his own fashion brand, guys, yeah. and it's fucking huge still to today. So I archive. I guess I keep those sneakers. Um, <coughs> um, that's all I could think of right now. But yes, I am still archiving hip hop in that way. I'm changing with the times. And as the time change, I'll find another way to archive. I don't know. But I will continue to archive. It's just in me. I, I'm not, I'm not a, I know they call me an, ar- an archivist, but I just am who I am. I just do that naturally. That's just me. Yeah. You know. Do you think that people ever will get tired, will ever get tired of nostalgia? No. It's yeah. built in us. We have to go back. I guess we have to go into the, the the neurological reasons why humans do that. Nostalgia is it, it reminds you. I don't know. It gives you a good feeling. How do you feel when um, when you experience nostalgia? How do you feel? Gives you like a that warm feeling. You know, it's a, it's it reminds you of the best of times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even though those weren't the best. Best of, of times. times. Yeah. We only remember the best parts of that yeah because i also like to call out people on that on that bullshit because the good old days because when it was happening a lot of times it felt it was like traumatic yeah <laughs> yeah but then when you look back it's yeah. like that was 100 <laughs> percent. i i can go i'm realistic enough to go uh, you know how what i felt like i was an insecure kid during those times yeah hip-hop was there and i was recording and i loved it but i was also dealing with girls and money and being poor. I had a job, but I knew I was poor. I knew I came from a poor community. Um, um, so it wasn't the best of times. I was, I wanted, I wanted more clothing. I wanted more money. I wanted more. I wanted the right girl. I wanted, I wanted to be comfortable. I wasn't. I was having fun, but it wasn't the greatest time in the world. It, yeah. I'm ha- honestly for me the greatest time in the world is when I started raising my kids. Like I could really say that. Like, but you know I think people are just nostalgic about that era. We we'll go back to to what you said. People go back in time and they and, they, and for some reason we filter out only keep the good and leave the bad, which is great. Yeah, it's good. You don't want to you know relive the bad stuff. But re- realistically, it wasn't the greatest time in the world. Politically, it wasn't. Economically, it might have not been for some of us. So, you know, nostalgia just kind of like it might it might be an inspiration tool. It might be something that we use to continue to push forward. Yeah, maybe continue creating nostalgia. Yeah, um, there's got to be a reason. I'm sure human beings were doing it a hundred thousand years ago. You feel me? So, um, if you, if if you had a migration path in Africa and your and your 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 people took that and you you came upon this rock and this is where y'all stopped off to drink or whatever. And you come back year after year, you're going to think about that rock. You're going to be like, Oh my God. Like I remember when I was a kid and I used to play here with my brother and we would stop here all the time. This place is special to me. You feel me? Like, you know, and maybe it's to promote, to cr- keep creating those situations, you know? So it's bigger than media per se, right? Like consuming music or videos and stuff like that. It's just something that our brain, I feel kind of does. I'm sure there's scientists out there who have developed these ideas, you know, who they know what's up, right? Mm-hmm. And we look it up and find it. But yeah. It's in us. Yeah, that's uh, definitely a perspective you don't re- usually hear people say right. too much, but um, I definitely understand why you say that. Right. If you don't mind answering this question, how lucrative can YouTube be? Because you have a, a nice size following over 3,500 subscribers and Right now, hunt yeah. right now, and hundreds of thousands of viewers, mm-hmm. uh, per views per video, and even before that, on the old hip hop VCR, you amassed <coughs> eleven thousand five hundred subscribers yes. and uploaded over six hundred videos. Yes. So your question is, how lucrative yeah. can YouTube be? Am, let me ask you: You think I'm a YouTuber? <laughs> <laughs> Technically, you are. Am yeah. I? Am I? Am I a YouTuber? First of all, I don't make a dime yeah. off YouTube. Not a dime. Regardless how much uh, content I, I've created for, uh, not for them, but on that platform, 
Um, I, I've never been paid a dime. I'm not eligible for monetization. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Because I have too many copyrights. Mm. Um, so I've never been paid by YouTube. Now, um, it's hard for me because I'm not, I don't consider myself a YouTuber, so I don't do any YouTube research. I'm not trying to be a YouTuber. So I don't know what would 11,500 subscribers uh, translate to when it came to to money yeah. if I were to be monetized. Yeah, I don't even know how that works either. I don't know. Yeah. Now, um, I did start a merch store to compensate for that. And the reason why I did it was to compensate for my time. I was spending time and money yeah. to publish these videos. Time is money. I run a business. If I spend a minute on anything other than my business, I'm losing money. Yeah. That's just how it goes. If I could spend 24 hours in my business, I would be fucking rich. So when I'm sleeping, I ain't making money. When I'm, sorry, when I'm on, when I'm doing hip hop VCR, I ain't making money for my, for my real business. So I had to find a way. So I started a website and um, a merch store. And at the peak, at the peak of the channel, I was making, not a lot of money, but I could tell it would eventually turn into something good. Yeah. Because I was making an average of one sale a day. One sale a day where there was a sticker. I So I sell stickers, shirts, sweaters. The profit margins aren't that good on the sweaters and shirts that I sell on my on my website. But the, the profit margins are over over 100% on the stickers. So if... If I, the more subscribers I was getting, the more sales I was getting on a daily basis. So if I said, if I could see a million subscribers on YouTube, I would almost probably be making between forty to sixty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Just from merch, if I could do that rough estimate right there, forty to sixty. If I had a million subscribers who tuned in and and gave me views, and then thus I was promoting my plat, my my merch store to them. You understand? So imagine 11,500 subscribers, I was seeing one sale a day. One sale a day. And that was pretty good. I was hearing chiching once a day. So if I if I keep multiplying that, you know, if I if I would have had 100,000 subscribers, I would have probably made around nine sales a day. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. So you keep doing the multiplication and and my channel was growing exponentially so it would have been more than that so again i don't i don't know how lucrative it could be now i do understand that youtube could be very lucrative you know you're on your way your yeah. your content is is um is monetized you can monetize yeah. your, your stuff so you know whenever you get to 4000 watch hours and 1000 subscribers are you there yet no i'm not quite there yet when you get there yeah. You're going to be able to monetize, and you're going to know right away. You know, they're going to sell you a couple of dollars at first, but you're going to know right away. You're going to do the multiplication and go, oh, if I do this, if I do this, I should see this kind of money. But it's exponential. It's multiplied as you grow, as the channel grows. Yeah. That's just how um, marketing works. It's it, it's hard for it to explain. I understand it because I run my own business. Yeah. It's exponential. You know, 11 – so if you if I had eleven thousand subscribers and that meant one sale there, it doesn't mean that I would have got two sales a day for twenty two thousand. Yeah. I might have got more. Mm -hmm. I might have got three. So it just grows exponentially like that. It's it's, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I hope you'll get there soon, and when you do, you're gonna be able to answer that question for yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. How lucrative? It I, I'll let you know. Yeah. What keeps hip hop VCR still going even with the obstacles that you faced and and will face in the future? Responsibility. Yeah responsibility um it's it's time consuming it's relatively annoying uh it takes up about two hours of my day in the morning i wake up two hours early just to post that day because i post on youtube instagram twitter and sometimes when i post magazines i have to scan the magazines put them together add some marketing material to it so i, I could are you scan on the printer yeah, yeah, I do scan yeah. on the printer. They scan pretty good, and yeah. they look really good. You've seen the scans? Um, uh, yes, I have. I have seen yeah. them. Yes, they, they're 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 mostly on Instagram. You can see ten. I do ten, ten pages, not ten pages, ten swipes, which can equal about twelve to thirteen pages of a magazine because they're long and skinny. But um, 
um, the I lost my train of thought here real quick. So, what was your question again? So you were talking about scanning. Yes. On magazines. Yes. So they, it takes up a lot of my time in the morning. But your question, excellent. Again. Oh, so I was yeah, I was asking. Um, yeah, what what uh, obstacles? Um, what keeps you going? Oh yes, yes, yes. So it's the responsibility, the responsibility uh, that despite. So I was listening to all that stuff because it's a lot of work, and I was listening to all that stuff that despite all that work and the fact that I'm not getting paid, there's got to be something motivating me yeah. to continue to post. Yeah, and it's responsibility. I feel like the stuff just needs to be out there. It does not belong in my possession in my archives mm. it belongs in the universe and that at this stage is the reason why i do it yeah and if it wasn't for the first shutdown i would still be posting daily which means more time more effort and i just found a rhythm i found a way to fit it into my day and i found a rhythm where it wouldn't interfere with my family time and my business time and that was the two to three hours in the morning and I would dedicate. So those who don't know, it takes two to three hours for me to do that. That's crazy. Rip the video, edit the video, um, post it on all the platforms, create some kind of marketing material, shout out the people who are on the video. Yeah. Like, it, it, like I, I can't believe that I sit there for two to three hours doing this. Sometimes I could do it quicker, but this time, I, two hours. No, I, I know, because when I'm posting these clips and stuff, bro, like, I'd be like, damn. Oh, it's just posting Bro. a video on Instagram. Though. Bro, <laughs> I woke up at 8 in the morning. It's fucking 10 a.m. I got to go to the studio. Yeah. And I just finished posting on social media. Yeah. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's, and, and I'm not even creating the content. Yeah. Content has already been made for me. I just have to curate it and put it together and shit like that and. Shit is crazy. So it's it's all responsibility, man. It's it's the only answer. It's, yeah. it's why I do it. I don't do it for money. Yeah. I'm not getting paid. Yeah. Nobody's paying me. I'm not getting nothing from this in regards to monetary or I'm not trying to build fame either. I'm not really trying to be famous. Yeah. I run my own business in my own way. I market in my own way. You know, I don't tie in hip hop ECR to my business so that way I could get business. Yeah. Like I, don't, I just, I'm, I separate it. People's like, yo, promote. Real up the field, promote your your photography business, and I'm like, man, I'm I'm doing that already. Yeah, I get my clients. I'm on Google. I'm yeah. marketing. You know, I got my own social media for that. Yeah, one. and that one takes work, but you know, it's just responsibility, man. And uh, that's why I want people to support the channel, like support it. You know, like like because there's a there's somebody behind this that cares. I'm not I'm not. There's no greed behind this stuff. There's no. You know, and honestly, you know who I'm talking to? I'm not even talking to the fans. I'm talking to the to the big ups. I'm talking to, to the Jay Z's and like those guys need to find a way to like continue a platform like mine. And I give two fucks about meeting these guys. Like, yeah, I'm a Jay Z fan, but I'm not doing this to fan out. Yeah. And none of that stuff. I'm a grown man. I got kids. <laughs> I can't be fanning out over another man or woman. Like, you understand? Like, I'm not a kid. The kids fan out. I don't fan out. I'm good. But you know, it's all about responsibility, and that's that's how it goes. That's how I roll with that. Yeah. So, what's next for you in hip hop VCR? Podcast, podcast. Um, always, always evolving the platform. Uh, I, I got a new intro. The intro is great. It, I didn't make it. It was it was gifted to me. I appreciate it. Fresh out, the guys at Fresh Out Podcast. Check them out. They're awesome. Uh, great brothers in the field. Um, so, you know, always tweaking hip hop VCR, making it more legit, more professional. Uh, the podcast is something that I'm, I'm working on with a partner of mine. Uh, he's a he's a musician, uh, so we're looking. You know, I have to find the time for this. It takes us so much time. A podcast, on top of, you just built this whole set. It took you like an hour and a half, bro. We didn't even start. This shit is crazy. It's gonna yeah. take time, cause you were doing it right. You gotta do it right. We could do this shit in five seconds. Do it wrong. Yeah. But you're doing it right. I wanna do it right. So those are the two main things right there. Just continuing the platform, pushing forward. Uh the 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 the, the, the subscriber count is up to three thousand six hundred, I think, today. It's growing still, like this despite the fact that I got knocked down. Yeah. I got up again. 
you know, 6,000 followers on Instagram. It might not be a lot for other people, but the thing is that I think it's a lot. I think, I think this is, I think, because I know where it's going. I know where it's going. So those are the next things right there. Look forward to the podcast and um, creating good content for that. And, you know, I, otherwise I, I can't think more merch. I guess I got to create more merch at yeah. some point. Yeah. I want to create more unique T-shirts and sweaters and stuff like that. Stuff for the culture. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. Yeah. So, Claudio, I know that you're a photographer by yep. trade, and mm-hmm. you're also a lover of hip-hop, a <coughs> genre where words are so important, yes. and the name of this podcast is Words Matter. Sure. So, with that you want me to freestyle right now? <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that being said, why do words matter to you? Damn, B. Uh, you know, you're asking the right person, because I like talking, and I've gotten... I've gotten through life and manipulated my way, positively manipulated yeah. my way through life. He's about to get canceled real quick. He's a manipulator. <laughs> yeah, word, word, <laughs> facts, facts. I, that's why I got to make sure I fix that, right? <coughs> but that word manipulation gets a bad rap. Yeah. It's just a word, right? It's a word. You use it. I use it. But you got to manipulate yourself through many situations. Manipulate the situation. Manipulate the environment. Um, and so I... My words have gotten me through a lot because my words show intent. They show motivation. They show reasoning. <coughs> so so they're everything for me. My, I, I, I'm, I'm a very expressive individual in all matters, especially my words. And I'm not, I wasn't really the kind of kid who liked school, hated English, I didn't, I didn't read my first book until I dropped out of college. Wow. Because it was stuffed down my throat before then. Then I learned how to read. And by by learning how to read, I mean that I learned how to like how to read. I knew how to read, but I learned how to read, which means I learned how to like it. And thus, when you like it, what happens when you like reading? You take everything in. When you don't like it, you're just reading words. You don't know what the fuck you're doing. You're just reading to the class, whatever the fuck. You're not consuming, you know. So it it, it, it means a lot. Um, ask me the question again so I can line it up again. Yeah, so why do words matter to you? Right. Because they, they control they control my environment. Yeah. They control mm. everything. They they I, I, I get to I get to manifestation. If I say it out loud, it's gonna happen. If I keep it to myself, nothing happens. So I've always been the type that if I have a goal, I say it out loud and I say it to everybody. Yeah. I'm going to do this one day. I'm going to be this kind of person one day. I won't be this type of person one day. Mm-hmm. Because I go, I, I hope they hold me to that. If I say I'm never going to be like this person because that person isn't good. If I ever run into the person I said that to, I want them to go, damn, Curly really did mean it. You feel me? So... It, 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 these, that's just examples of how w- your words control everything. And especially in today's day and age where warriors are defined by a, not by how you fight and whether you could climb a horse and win the battle or jo- uh, win in the Coliseum. Like, you know, there are warriors and they play sports yeah. and yeah. they fight. They, they fight in boxing rings yeah. and, and all that stuff and octagons. <clears throat> but they're also warriors, and I'm that kind of warrior. I'm adaptive. So in this world where the gift to gab is important, mm-hmm. I have some of that. Yeah. And so I've I've always um, uh, been able to profit from that. Whether it's when I used to have a job and work for somebody, I was always in favoritism. People liked me. Mm-hmm. You know why? Because I'm a good talker. And I don't. I never used it for evil. I never mm-hmm. manipulated people to step on their necks. Everyone who knows me knows. Obviously, I've always wanted to help. So that never was the thing for me. So, words make the world go around. It depends what what side of the bed you wake up. What makes the world go around? Yeah. Sometimes it's money. Yeah. Sometimes it's contracts. Sometimes it's words. Sometimes it's women. Sometimes it, it could be anything. But <coughs> um, uh, my life revolves around 
words. Yeah. The words I hear and the words I say. Yeah. Manifestation. Whatever I want to happen, I'm gonna say it. Yeah. And it's gonna happen. And that's it. And I'm sure you could relate to that. Yeah. You know, you're doing big things here. And thank you. And you telling I'm sure you're telling people about it and you put it's public, you let everyone know. And um and this is proof, you know, you're doing it. And it's, it's awesome, and I, I commend you for that. Thank you. So uh, keep pushing forward that, and um, keep putting the words out there. Yeah, your words out there, because then uh, the, 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 somebody's listening. Yeah, somebody's listening, and you're gonna you're gonna be blessed for it. Thank you. So I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Nice. Thank you, Claudio Abreu, yep. um, founder of Hip Hop VCR. Yep. For uh, allowing me to interview him and. I'm right in the Bronx. He's right in Mount Vernon. So it was great to just, you know, get to interview in such a short distance. And uh, for everybody that's listening, everybody that's watching, please like, comment, and subscribe on the Words Matter Network YouTube channel. Uh, please rate on uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify because that's how I you know, start climbing up them charts in, uh, in, the, in the genre that this podcast is under. So please do that. Do that. And uh, yeah, man, thank you once again. And words matter.